Welcome to Direction Northeast. Hello, I'm Chelsea Taylor. This program is a presentation of the Mass Communications Department of Northeast State Community College. African American music is a part of the foundation of the American musical experience. From the Negro spirituals of the South to the urban sounds of the blues, funk and hip hop, black music had moved the world. We will be back in just a moment to learn more about the influence of African American music with our guest, Jonathan Blanchard. Business, medical, and financial institutions must have confidence in the data that they use. Information assurance is the strategic use of technology and software to protect data from internal and external threats. Northeast State offers an associate's degree program designed to fill the demand for information assurance professionals. The information assurance program offers hands-on personal instruction. Northeast State Community College is an accredited institution offering financial aid and job placement. Northeast State, we're here to get you there. What if there was a place where your mind is nourished, your time respected, a place where you don't feel lost in the crowd, where you get the attention you need and deserve? What if that place is right here, right here, right here, all along, over 80 programs of study, a main campus, and convenient teaching sites, unlimited potential, right in your backyard, Northeast State, Northeast State, Northeast State Community College. Our guest for this episode of Direction Northeast comes from Memphis, where a steady diet of blues, rock and roll, and gospel helped shape his musical taste. Bass vocalist Jonathan Blanchard has focused much of his career studying and performing the evolution of Negro spiritual to the more modern musical forms. Welcome Jonathan Blanchard to Direction Northeast. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. So let's just jump right on into the interview. Okay. How did you become involved with the spiritual music? Well, you know, at a very early age, my parents introduced me, or began introducing me to my culture, part of which was the music that was coming through Memphis uh, with Stax Records and your Earth, Wind, and Fire and the Bar Kays and Isaac Hayes, Al Green. And I remember my first concert being Sweet Honey and the Rock. And if you don't know who Sweet Honey and the Rock is, they are a group of women who sing a cappella and they intertwine these great harmonies to really paint a picture for you and put you in the mindset of the music. And that was my first introduction uh, to the Negro spiritual. And from that point on, I was kind of hooked. How would you describe your music as it relates to more modern music that seems to be more popular? Well, you know, this, I'm a soul singer. And what I sing is soul music. Now, what I'm presenting just happen to be songs that are influenced by the Negro spiritual, but all forms of American music is influenced by the spiritual. For the, the spiritual is America's first original music, out of which comes your blues and your, your jazz and your country and your gospel and your rock and roll. So as a soul singer, I have to have respect for uh, its beginnings, those field songs that were, that were brought here with enslaved Africans. When you're, when you're performing along with the history of the music, what else do you hope to portray to your audience? Well, I hope it leaves them with a hunger, and that is a hunger to, to study and to research for themselves uh, America, America's culture. That's the entire idea, is to provoke thought and to, and to uh, provoke research in your own, your own study and come to a conclusion for yourself. You know, if you can understand the past, if you can understand the history of an art form or the history of music per se, then you can have a better appreciation for what you're listening to now. You know, if you, if you understand the call and response that was in the Negro spiritual, then you can understand when I say, hey, you say ho in hip hop and, and R&B. So you believe that everybody can relate to your music? Absolutely. Right? It's Absolutely. not, you're not just trying to inspire one group of people? Uh, even if I was, it would be impossible. 
because we're all entrenched in the culture. We're all entrenched in the culture of modern music, which is influenced by the spiritual again. And we're all influenced in, by the spiritual. You may not know the lyrics, but if I start humming a song, you'll be able to hum along with me. Even though you and I may not be the same age or from the same background, those songs are in our blood, you know. And the spiritual is not something that is isolated to one group of people, per se. Uh, for example, have you ever heard of a white spiritual? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that you have. Finish the rest of it. <laughs> I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's a white spiritual. You see, spirituals are written on, or were typically written on the black keys of a piano. They call it the slave scale. But that pentatonic scale was something that the enslaved Africans brought to this country with them. And when white composers would use that scale to write spirituals, they would call them white spirituals. And Amazing Grace is one of those songs. You see, when I think it was John Newton, he became a born-again preacher. But before that happened, he ran slave ships. So oftentimes, running those slave ships, you would hear West African tunes coming up out of the bowels of that ship. And that's where it said it's believed that he got the, the tune for that song. Not the lyrics, but the tune, the melody itself. So I say all that to say that the spiritual is universal. And anyone that has gone through something or is experiencing some hardship or frustration now can relate to those songs. With that, with that being so relatable to everybody, mm -hmm. how do you feel as if it was so central just to African Americans? Well, at the time, being kidnapped from your country, being kidnapped from your home and your friends, and being taken to a foreign land, a strange land. And you gotta think, the people that made that trip were between the ages of 15 and 25. There were no old people. So there was no one there to really instill the culture. You know, these are all young people, very young people, still very impressionable. These are the ones who survived that three to six month long trip being shackled at the bottom of a ship. So for them to make it over here and then be stripped of their tradition, their religion, and their language, they had to devise some sort of way to hold on to what little bit of culture they could remember, and also some sort of way to communicate with one another. So they devised these spirituals from Bible stories and used them as a coded language whether they were trying to plan escapes, or trying to plan revolts, or they just wanted to express their honest emotion about how they felt. You know, that was something that was not allowed then. So they had to find other ways of doing it. And I think that, that is what made it unique, or gave it a more unique um, feeling for those who were actually in bondage. Do you think that with them making that music, did they try to portray, you know, try to communicate with any other forms or mm. just strictly with the music? Well, you know, when they were first brought here, they, they were communicating with, with drums. But once, once slave owners realized that the drum was being used in that way, it was banned and outlawed as well. And even to this point, in some, in some cities, you had to have a permit to to beat a drum in chorus in public areas, you know. So this is so the spiritual is one way that they communicated. Do you think within the spiritual music mm -hmm. that that's the only way you said that they pretty much were able? Why do you think that the music wasn't banned? Well, th that wasn't the only way, and it wasn't banned because the slave master never caught on that that's what it was being used for. Mm -hmm. But other ways they communicated was through quilting. 
there were quilts that were created that were passed down from generation to generation. And these quilts were sometimes the history of the family, and sometimes they were roadmaps to freedom. And they had, they had spots on them that were, that were safe houses on the way there, and those kind of things, whether they were going west over the Mississippi and the Spanish territory, or they were going north over the uh, Ohio and the Missouri. Do you, with the traveling that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. at the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. do you believe that the spiritual music helped that progress at all? Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you listen to a song like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, mm -hmm. it says, um, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming forth to, that's your part, coming forth to carry me home. Here's the call. A band of angels coming after me. Your response, coming forth to carry me home. Now. Swing Low Sweet Chariot. The chariot represents the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's swinging low is because it's coming from the north, swinging down. Mm -hmm. And anything that swings down has to swing back where? Back up north. Has to swing back up. Sweet Chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Home in this song represents freedom. I looked over the Jordan, where there's no Jordan River in the US. But there is the Mississippi again, and there is the Ohio and the Missouri. I saw a band of angels. These angels represent the abolitionists who were protecting those who were running away and hiding them and helping them to freedom. So absolutely, these songs played a, a great role in, in the freeing of enslaved Africans through the Underground Railroad. Even songs like Wade in the Water, you know, these are songs that you would hear late at night from plantation to plantation, letting those who were escaping know that dogs had been unleashed and the only way to get rid of your scent, as far as the dogs were concerned, was to either walk in the water or to take an onion and rub it on the sole of your foot. Do you think compared, how would you compare spiritual music to more black modern music mm -hmm. as we know today? Uh, I, would pref I would probably compare it to all forms of uh, American music. Um, whether it's, whether it's so-called black music per se, or even if it's, if it's Appalachian music. You know, a lot, of this, a lot of this music comes out of the same place. And what I mean by that comes out of the same emotion, comes out of the same oppression. You know, your, your jazz movement, your, your blues movement, those things came, well, particularly blues came out of the Delta and you're talking about uh, people who were financially poor, you know, um, and struggling, and, and all the things that come along with not having everything that you need. Uh, you talk about jazz, or you talk about the beginnings of rock and roll. Those things, they come out of the same human mind frame or human heart frame, if you will. You know, they come out of the oppression or feeling, or feeling of frustration, you know, or, or downtroddenness. Even, even with your hip hop, your original forms of hip hop, your, your traditional hip hop, I'm talking about the hip hop that started in the 60s. You know, that, the rapping that started in the 60s, uh, up until now, deals a lot with people talking about their current state of living and the longing to be something other than that or the longing to be uh, out of that or the longing to be successful as far as success is shown to them. You know, we may listen to hip hop and say, well, all they're talking about is cars and clothes and status and all these kind of things, but is that not the American dream that we have portrayed? So why would they not long for that, and why would that not be reflected in the music? You know. 
With that American Dream, mm -hmm. do you relate any of that to your music? Or do you mainly focus on, you know, the past that we've been talking about? Well, I think in order to understand the present, you have to have a good understanding of the past. Mm -hmm. um, and in order for something to be considered the past, you had to have already conquered it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. These things that were, that were talked about during slavery are the same things they were talked about during Reconstruction, are the same things they were talked about during Jim Crow, are the same things they were talked about in the 80s, the same things that were talked about in the 60s, the same things that are talked about now. You know, I mean, right now, amongst industrial countries, we have the largest amount of our population incarcerated for one reason or another. So we're still dealing with the same, the same issues. We're still dealing with trying to maintain some level of free or cheap labor to keep this whole thing moving. So, so for me, when I'm speaking of the spirituals, or I'm singing the spirituals, for me, I'm still talking about right now because we're still dealing with the same issues. We're still dealing with this fear that we have of each other. And now I'm talking about the races. I'm talking about black and white. This unknown fear that someone has told us to have towards each other. And we believe them. But in reality, we're all in the same boat together. You know, we hadn't figured it out yet. But uh, we're, we're slowly working on it, but the, the battle is far from being won. Do you feel like your music helps you with that battle more than, more than say it would if you were working in an office? <laughs> like oh, your music is definitely. more relatable. Definitely. For me, it is, for me, and I think this is where you're going with it, for me it is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just for the audience, it's, it's, for, it's for me. Um, I have to research to speak on it. Um, I have to experience other cultures to be able to do this. I have to, because I have to be able to, I have to relate this message to you who may not have the same experiences I have. You may, but you may not. So I have to be able to present the spiritual in a space where you can understand. You understand? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I have to be, I have to be pretty well versed in it. And in that, not only am I teaching, but I'm learning. You know, we, I, I do this all over the country with all, kinds of, with all kinds of audiences, from small children to the elderly. You know, all races, all ages, all religions, you name it. I've performed in mosques, you know, and you have to be able to relate these things. Do you find, as in trying to relate everything to everybody, that helps get more of how, what you believe out of it helps people understand more just by able, being able to reach out to different groups of people? You know, what I find is that, what I find is that, most people can already relate to it. Because again, as we said in the beginning, they've heard these songs. They're familiar with them. Their grandmother was humming them. You know, um, they've heard them in television shows. So they already kind of relate. But once you start telling them the story behind it, and they get a better understanding of why these songs exist, uh, I, I believe it, comes, it becomes more real for them. How does that make you feel, knowing that people can relate to you so easily? Satisfied. It's you, satisfying. How, how does that satisfy you? Because I feel like there's something that I've contributed, you know, and I think that's what, I think that's what any man wants to do is to leave, to leave something productive and constructive uh, for society. You know, we want to be able to give something back. And when I say man, I'm, th I'm saying it in terms of mankind. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to be able to leave a legacy. You want to be able to uh, 
help, man. Kind of, you want to be able to assist in um, prolonging um, humankind, you know. And I think that by doing this, or the spiritual has given me an opportunity to do that. In order to leave that legacy, what sparks your music? Like, I know you write a few of your own songs. Mm -hmm. Where do you get the inspiration to have that legacy and go out to reach all those people? Um, people. You know, current events, uh, conversations that I have with people, um, the news, uh, sometimes the news versus the actual truth <laughs> sparks that. Um, and just this, uh, this wanting to make everyone aware of what's going on around them and why it's going on, you know. That's what pretty much sparks my writing. I know you have a website. Mm -hmm. How do you reach out with, without music other than your website to people? Well, I'm in schools quite a bit, uh, K through 12. We are there. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, Facebook dot com backslash Jonathan Blanchard. I'm also on Twitter as Jonathan Blanchard. Mm -hmm. uh, you can reach me there. And um, all of my shows are, are on all of those um, programs. What do you know? On all of those um, internet websites and those kind of things. So I'm available. Do you feel as if all being available on all those sources allows you, you say you reach out to everybody, do mm -hmm. you feel like that's as if why you're able to do that? It's a part of it. Another part of it is I have a really, really good manager who is also my mother. <laughs> 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 and, she, um, and she is a hawk at what she does and she, uh, she does a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of research and a lot of cold calling and those kind of things, and that, that really, really helps. She is definitely the, the uh, catalyst, for sure. Mm -hmm. You said your mother is your manager. That's right. How, I know she affected you, your music mm -hmm. by taking you to that concert at mm -hmm. a very young age. Mm -hmm. How does she continue that to well, this day? Well, you know, my, my mother is a um, retired librarian. Mm -hmm. uh, she served for a little over 30 years in the uh, Memphis public school system. So just having that influence of, of books and information always being around and just exposing me to things and traveling, jumping on Amtrak and traveling across the country and those kind of things have, have drastically influenced me. It, 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 I think it has influenced how I view others. You know, my father taking me out of the country and overseas and, and all that has influenced how I see uh, other cultures in general. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. With the other cultures, mm -hmm. how, how are you able to relate to those so easily? Well, it's very practical. You learn how to be accepting of people. Um, where they are. You learn how to be less judgmental. And I think that's half the battle. You learn how not to be intimidated by what you don't understand, you know, or to be arrogant towards things that you may not have a knowledge base of, you know. Instead of opening your mouth, you open your ears. It's just, just as if you went into someone's house. They invited you in and you didn't know them and they invited you in, instead of saying, when you saw a piece of art on the wall, instead of saying, well, that's ugly, I don't like it, because you've never seen it before, you say, well, this is an interesting piece. Could you tell me about it? Do you feel as if most people aren't able to do that? Or like I think most people are just fear-driven, and that fear uh, causes them to be insecure. And insecurity sometimes causes us to act outside of our character. And it, it limits us. And that's something that we all have to deal with. You know. Well, thank, thank you for all of 
that you've done for us. My pleasure. Us. My pleasure. We'll be back in a moment just to wrap up Direction Northeast. What if there was a place where your mind is nourished? Your time respected. A place where you don't feel lost in the crowd. Where you get the attention you need. And deserve. What if that place is right here? Right here. Right here, all along. Over 80 programs of study. A main campus. And convenient teaching sites. Unlimited potential. Right in your backyard. Northeast State. Northeast State. Northeast State Community College. Business, medical, and financial institutions must have confidence in the data that they use. Information assurance is the strategic use of technology and software to protect data from internal and external threats. Northeast State offers an associate's degree program designed to fill the demand for information assurance professionals. The information assurance program offers hands-on personal instruction. Northeast State Community College is an accredited institution offering financial aid and job placement. Northeast State, we're here to get you there. That concludes the program for today. We learned about the power of music through the eyes of our guest, bass vocalist, Jonathan Blanchard. Community is very important to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at just a few of the subjects they find important. Until we meet again next time, on our behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Chelsea Taylor, and this is Direction Northeast.